Well, good morning, everybody. Good to have you guys here today. And uh, God is here, and uh, he is to be praised and glorified in all that we do here. Um, we are going to uh, start off by standing and singing our song of contemplation. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, we cry holy, 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 we cry holy. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for every day. But Lord, we are sinners. And even though we begin this service in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we come to you in confession. We admit to you that we are wrong. We are sinners. We sin against you in what we do, what we say, even by what we think. And Lord, we are sorry. Hear us now as we we spend a few moments as we think about and confess to you our sins and the privacy of our own hearts. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing us and thank you for forgiving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so I ask you, do you believe that you are a sinner? Then say yes. And are you sorry for your sin? Let's say yes. And do you believe that Jesus can forgive you for your sin because of what he did for us on the cross? Then say yes. Then I can assure you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And because of what God does and what and who he is, he is so good, we, we sing about that now. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. Who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide. searching for answers. Will you provide
satisfied Cause you know just what we need before we say a word You're a good, good Father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am first reading today is taken from uh, Isaiah 51, 1 through 6. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlines hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment. And they who dwell in it will die in like manner, but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading today is taken from Romans verses 11, uh, chapter 11, verses 33 through 12, 8. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable 
and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Here ends our second reading. May you stand for the gospel. In verses 13 to 20. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the, kings, the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. You may remain standing as we uh, join together in singing uh, one, one, uh, one of our theme songs from a few months ago here called uh, Can You Believe It? God gives sight to the blind. Can you believe that He turns water into wine? Can you believe that Jesus suffered and died? Can you believe that Jesus came back to life? Lord, I believe you are the Christ. You are the Son and our God, Lord, I believe and soon we'll see the glory of the King, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, you are the Son and our God, and I believe that soon we'll see the glory and the power of our King. that he gives thirst to souls to life. Can you believe that all the sinners he will find? Can you believe that he destroyed Satan's life? Can you believe that God gives hope for our lives? Lord, I believe you are the Christ are the Son and our God. Lord, I believe and soon we'll see the glory of the King. Lord, I believe you are the Christ. You are the Son and our God. And I believe and soon we'll see the glory and the power of our King. This is my creed. This is what I believe, this is my creed, this is what I believe, this is my creed, this is what I believe, this is my creed, this is what I believe, Lord, I believe you are the Christ.
Christ, you are the Son and our God, and I believe and soon will see the glory of the King. Lord, I believe you are the Christ, you are the Son and our God, and I believe that soon we'll see the glory and the power of our King. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Roaming through Romans. I guess you've heard that before, haven't you? This is now the 11th message from the series, Roman through Romans, and we are at chapter 11 and 12 today. You heard the gospel lesson a few minutes ago. We're just going to use the first four verses of that lesson today as a basis for a message, the first four. Romans chapter 11, verses 31, 32, 33, and 34. These are powerful words. I mean, these words are a treasure. If you want to uh, select four verses from the Bible that you would like to put to memory that are a treasure, these four would be wonderful. In fact, they're so wonderful that after Paul wrote them, he said, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we're going to, my goal this morning is is not to teach you anything, because you know it all, right? You do know. My goal this morning is not to um, tell you what to do. That comes next Sunday. My goal today is to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart, so that at the end of the message, you'll all stand, and you all say, to him be the glory forever and ever, amen, like the apostle Paul did. So, let's begin. Now, first of all, um, let me find the right place. Romans chapter, chapter 11, beginning at verse 33. Here's how he says it. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. A generation ago, uh, J.B. J. B. Phillips wrote a book called Your God is Too Small, and I think the title explains the contents of the book. I'd like to simply read a, a little summary uh, that I kind of put together after I read the book many years ago. Here's kind of a summary of the book, Your God is Too Small. If your God is too small, perhaps you need to take another look at the God of the Bible. Over the centuries, theologians have used certain words to describe his essence, sovereign, almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, and so forth. But no list of adjectives could ever adequately picture the immenseness of God. He is so big that we don't even have the proper words to describe his bigness. He is bigger than our biggest words and grander than our grandest conceptions. Because he is God, no words or thoughts of mortal men and women could ever compass his greatness. He's far bigger than we imagine. His presence fills the universe. He's more powerful than we know, wiser than all the wisdom of the wisest men and women. His love is beyond human understanding. His grace has no limits. His holiness is infinite and his ways are past finding out. He has no beginning, and he has no end. He created all things, and all things exist by his divine power. He has no peers. No one gives him advice. No one fully understands him. He's perfect in all of his perfections. That's God. What a God we have. And that's the God that the Apostle Paul is describing in these four verses we're going to talk about today. 
So let's get to it. Let's start verse by verse. First of all, verse 33. There's, there's three things that Paul says in verse 33 about God, three facts about God. Number one, he knows everything there is to know. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, the depth of God's wisdom. How deep is it? The depth of God's knowledge. How deep is God's knowledge? How can we even begin to understand the bigness, the immenseness, the fullness, the wisdom, the knowledge of God? I brought a, a cup, the biggest cup that I could find in our house this morning. It's not a very big cup, but it's the biggest one we have. How foolish would it be for me to think that I could take this cup and I could empty the ocean with this cup. Try it, Reiner, try it. Ain't going to happen. Because the ocean is too deep, it's too wide, too much, too much there. I mean, even to begin to think that I could empty the ocean with this little cup. Think of the immenseness of God's knowledge, of God's wisdom. Think of the immenseness of God. And that's what Paul is describing here. God knows everything. There's anything he doesn't know. God knows exactly how many galaxies, how many stars there are in the sky. God knows exactly what you're thinking right now. God knows exactly who the next president of the United States will be in November. He knows the exact votes that Biden will get or that Trump will get. He knows everything. Everything. Can we even begin to understand that and to imagine that? That's what Paul is saying. Oh, how, how, how the riches of his wisdom and his knowledge. So that's number one. The first fact he points out is he knows everything there is to know. And there's nothing he doesn't know. A number of years ago, I read an article, and I don't remember where it was anymore, some theological magazine, I'm sure it was, but I don't know what it was. It talked about the prevenient grace of God. And I had never even heard of that word before. But I've got the portion of the article that I, that I read summarized here. I might just like, like to read it for you. The phrase, which was new to me, refers to the grace that goes before. Here's a working definition. In every situation of life, God is already at work before I get there. While I'm in Tuesday, he's clearing the road for me on Friday. God is already at work providing solutions for problems I don't even know I have yet. Are you worried about next week? Forget it. He's already there. What about the crucial meeting you have next Monday? Don't sweat it. He's already there. What about that surgery you're facing in a few days? Fear not. He's already there. That's the prevenient grace of God. He goes before his people. He's at work in the future while we live in the present. He can do that because he knows everything there is to know. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it just blows our mind. But that's the prevenient grace of God. He knows everything there is to know. But the second thing the Apostle Paul also says is not just that, but number two, he also says he makes plans we don't understand. Verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments, how unsearchable his judgments. Other translations, in fact, the one that Lynn just read from, another NIV translation, I believe it was, says it's inscrutable. His ways are inscrutable, which means beyond human understanding. His judgment, his ways are beyond us. 
We'll never figure it out. It's, it's over our heads, way over our heads. Our little minds can't comprehend God and God's ways. Our little understanding can't understand what his will is. John Wesley said it this way one time. He said, show me a worm that comprehends a man, and I'll show you a man that can comprehend God. It can't be done. It's impossible. There's no way. He alone knows. He makes plans we can't understand. And also, thirdly, he alone knows why everything happens. You know, we often have that question again and again, why, why, why? Why, God? Why do you allow little children to be killed by drunken drivers or drunken men and women? Why? You know, why do why do honest people have to suffer? Or, or why a virus? I mean, God, you can wipe out that virus just like that. Why don't you do it? I mean, uh, well, we have all these questions of God, don't we, as to why. Paul says, God alone knows why everything happens. His paths are, are, are beyond tracing out. So according to the Apostle Paul, there's three facts in verse 33 that we want to note. Number one, he knows everything there is to know. Number two, he makes plans we can't understand. And number three, he knows why things happen. But Paul goes on with verse 34 and 35, two more verses. And in those two verses, he asks three rhetorical questions. And each question begins with, who has? Who has? Who has? And the answer is always the same. No one. No one. No one. Here it is. Here's the verse. Two verses. 34 and 35. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has given to God that God should repay him? Who has? Who has? Who has? The answer is no one. So, Three things Paul is saying here. First of all, no one can know the mind of God. No one can know the mind of God. Who has known the mind of our Lord? We don't. We can't know his, his, his mind. We can't even describe him. If I were to ask you to describe God, how could you begin to describe him? You know, there's that story, and you've all heard that story and maybe even read the story of the six blind men who tried to describe an elephant. Remember that? I mean, that's a little children's book. I think that's what it is. I'm not sure anymore. About the first blind man who went up to the elephant and felt his tusks. His tusk. His tusk. I'm sorry. One tusk. Felt his tusk. And he says, oh, the elephant is like a spear. The second blind man went up to the elephant and, and did his ears and felt his ears. He says, oh, the elephant's like a fan. The third blind man went up to the trunk of the elephant and felt the big trunk and said, oh, my goodness, the elephant is like a snake. And the fourth blind man then went up against the elephant and uh, on its big side, huge stomach side, and said, oh, an elephant is like a wall. And the next blind man, the fifth blind man, went up to the elephant's leg and felt the big leg of the elephant and said, oh, no, the elephant is like a tree. And the sixth blind man then went and felt the tail, the little tail of the elephant. He said, oh, no, you're all wrong, he said. The elephant is, is like, a, like a, a rope. Now, who was right? Which blind man was right? None of them. Which one was wrong? They all were. Because you can't describe, and a blind man can't describe an elephant in a correct way. Neither can we describe God correctly on our own. Without the Spirit's help, without the Scripture's help, there's no way we can do it. 
No one can know the mind of God. The second thing that Paul says in these verses is, no one can counsel God. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who can give God counsel? Can you? Can you give God advice? Can, adv can you advise God? There's the story of the college student who didn't study at all. And it came to the final test in economics. It was right before Christmas. And he took the test. And he, of course, he didn't know any answers. And so on the bottom of the page, part of the test, he wrote, he says, uh, Professor, only God knows the answer to these questions. Merry Christmas. It handed his paper in. After Christmas, he came back to class. And, after cl and, and he got his paper back. Underneath, the professor had written the words, God gets 100%. You get zero. Happy New Year. There's no way we can begin to counsel God and give God advice. He's God. He's God. And the third thing that the Apostle Paul then says in these verses is no one can accuse God of unfairness. No one can say, God, you owe me something. Or God, you've been unfair to me. Or God, you've been unkind to me. We can't do that because God is God. God is all mercy. He's all grace. He's all love. And then Paul ends up this whole section then with just one verse. And here's the verse. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So what Paul is saying is, God's the source of all things. Everything comes from God. Everything we have comes from God. Um, families. We all have some families, don't we? They all come from God. Our finances. They all come from God. Um, our health. The health that we do have comes from God. God's the source of all things. Everything comes from him. And most importantly, our spiritual life comes from God. Our relationship with Jesus comes from God. It's God's spirit that works that in all of us. And that's a gift. It all comes from God. Every part of our life, whether it's spiritual or physical or emotional, it comes from God. Secondly, Paul also says he's the source of all things. I mean, he's the sustainer of all things. In other words, it doesn't just come from him. It goes through him to us. He's the king. He's in control. He's our Lord. It all comes through him to us. And lastly, he says he's the supreme purpose. Supreme purpose of all things. For from him and through him and for him are all things. He is the beginning, he's the middle, and he's the end of everything. No wonder Paul says to him, be the glory forever and ever. You know, life in many ways is, <coughs> I think, like a jigsaw puzzle. And we don't have the picture of the box. We don't have the, the box. We just have pieces. Have you ever tried to put a jigsaw puzzle together without the picture? It's pretty hard. Uh, have you ever had a jigsaw puzzle with a thousand pieces and you can't find the picture? It's very difficult. Many ways I think, I sometimes think that our life is like that. Only God has the picture. He's got the box. <coughs> We've got the pieces. But God didn't leave us that way in such a terrible state. He gave us something. 
He gave us Jesus, which that's in the middle of the picture. And he has given us the Holy Spirit so we can begin to put some pieces together around Jesus. And slowly but surely, our life begins to make sense. It makes sense because of God's gift to us of Jesus. He's the center of the picture. He's in the middle of our lives. He's right smack in the middle. And, and Jesus is a gift to us from Almighty God. And then the Holy Spirit who works in us and through us, through the Word, and we begin to make some sense out of our lives. That's how I view it. And I thank God for that gift of Holy Spirit. Because without, without the Holy Spirit, there's no way that we could begin to make sense out of our lives. And I thank God for Jesus, his only son, our Lord, that he put on the, on the cross so that he could be the middle of our lives, the center of our lives. And then Paul ends this whole thing with those beautiful words. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And I'd like to uh, have us end it that way too. So if I could encourage you to stand and uh, stand and, and let's give glory to God this morning for all the blessings that he's given us in our lives. And there's so many. I'm just going to mention a few. And as I mention them, I'd like to have you, with the Spirit's help, respond by saying, to him be the glory forever. Amen. So let me, uh, let me just suggest a few of them. In life and in death, let's say it together, to him be the glory forever. In joy and in sorrow, to him be the glory forever. In good days and in dark nights, to him be the glory forever. In sickness and in health, to him be the glory forever. In prosperity and in poverty, to him be the glory forever. In days of peace and days of war, to him be the glory forever. With masks or no masks, to him be the glory forever. In moments of victory or in darkest defeat, to him be the glory forever. In heaven and on earth, to him be the glory forever. And with the Apostle Paul, we say, for from him and through him and for him are all things. And together, to him be the glory forever. Amen. Confessing our faith and giving God glory through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Oh God, great and mighty God, thank you for allowing us to bring our praise to you. We don't deserve the love and forgiveness you offer us. We are sinners and we sin every day. We need a savior. Thank you for providing that savior in Jesus. We pray too for many who are depressed, who are weary. Please give them hope, give them faith in you. There are many people who suffer from health issues, from stress, from so many concerns. Lives are, our, our lives are in your hands. You help us through the hard times. We pray for Pastor Paul Hemingway, who has two divine calls, one to serve you at Trinity Lutheran Church in Springfield, Illinois, and one to serve you here. Guide him to a God-pleasing decision. May your will be done. We pray for all families. We pray for our president, the Congress, our governor, 
and all elected and appointed leaders. The members of the armed forces are police, firefighters, and emergency medical personnel in their duties to protect and serve. We pray for all who are sick, for relief of those who are suffering, for the comfort of those who grieve, and the peace of those who are dying. Lord, we pray for those that are hospitalized or recovering from surgery, list in our bulletin. We pray for Tina, Ron, Karen, Delbert, Laura, Luke, Rhonda. We also pray for Robert, Roberta, Lydia, Dennis, Becca, Jeremy, McKenna, and Ivan. Thank you for this beautiful world that you've given us to enjoy. The mountains, the lakes, the rivers, the trees and wildflowers that you created. How we love the beauty of your creation. Please help us as we live for you, that all we do and say glorifies you and builds up your people. Help us to show your love to all and to be a light in the darkness. Send your Holy Spirit to speak to us through your word and strengthen our faith. We ask this all for, for, for Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We'll remain standing as we sing our final song here. And uh, yesterday I was talking to someone who said, well, I'm not sure I like that song because of the word reckless in there. And so I, I want to share with you the meaning of the word reckless here without caring about the consequences of an action. And if we think about the consequences of the action, what Jesus did for us, he died on the cross. He suffered for us. And so, and so by definition, that action technically was reckless because he didn't care. He cared about us. He didn't care about the consequences of that action except that it would be to be our Savior. So let's sing. I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. Bye. 
heart's still on ground Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down now you won't tear down coming after me no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down now you won't tear down coming after me oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god Chases me down, bites till I'm found, leaves the 99. I don't deserve it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Take a look at the back of your bulletin here. I've got the wrong one here, wrong color, but you have the blue ones here. And on the back of those blue sheets is uh, an attendance record here. We're going to start taking attendance again. And uh, we, we don't have those little cards in the pews just because we can't wash them all in between services and everything. But uh, you can certainly fill this out if you have a pen or pencil. You're like, oh, Pastor Kevin, I, don't, I didn't bring a pen or pencil with me today. You didn't tell me we we're going to fill up stuff on paper. So if you don't have one, you can actually go to our website to trinitycalispell.org slash attendance and you can fill out this the same exact thing here. One thing too here, um, this is also for people that are home, so hi people at home watching on video here. Um, if, if, if you're watching on, on, on video and you're like, well how do I fill out an attendance card? Go online to trinitycalispell.org and click on the attendance button there and you can do that. And I know some people are like, oh well then all these people are going to just pretend like they're attending and just clicking out that thing here. Well, you, there's a trivia question, too, that especially people that are maybe needing credit for attending uh, worship services for the school or something like that, you have to fill out that uh, uh, trivia question, and uh, then you'll be able to get that uh, credit for, for that. But anyway, um, uh, the other thing, too, here, speaking of worship services here, in a few weeks is normally our last camp service of the year, Labor Day weekend, but uh, we've had some requests that we continue that since that's an outdoor service that we can still worship outdoors and uh, because of COVID some people prefer that to wearing masks in, in, in inside and so we're going to continue the camp service but we'll have to move the time because our services on Sunday morning will still shift to our fall schedule with eight o'clock early service and 10 45 late service with Bible classes and Sunday school between so if you want to go to the camp service That'll now be after Labor Day weekend. It will be at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So just want to let you know about that. Jeff. All right. Thank you very much. I am going to make an announcement, but uh, first of all, I'm just going to talk a little bit about pastors. Um, so my, my wife sometimes says, if it goes without saying, maybe it needs to be said. So um, I'm, I'm just a little bit impromptu here, but just stay with me. Uh, first of all, uh, I just want to thank Pastor Kevin. Uh, our only pastor here at, at Trinity at the, at the time, and he's doing a lot and has his hands full, and uh, I do want to thank him for that. And then, so about my comment, if it goes without saying, it was great having Pastor Reiner uh, here this morning. We have some new members, and I think maybe all of you know Pastor Reiner, but maybe, maybe you don't. Pastor Reiner served here at Trinity for, give me a number. Only 25 years. Uh, he was here when we joined, um, so it was great to have you. Uh, Pastor Dan Worcester, uh, right, right up front here, served at Trinity for a number of years. Um, don't have that fact. So uh, any of you new members, this is kind of kind of neat. We have a little bit of a privilege here having, having some pastors here uh, with us this morning. And then 
So the announcement about uh, Pastor Paul Hemingway. If you haven't read the bulletin, there is a, a pretty complete uh, blurb in there about that. He had a COVID-related incident in his church, he called me. He was obviously very upset that this, that this happened right a few days before him coming out here to visit us. And he just wanted you to know he is very excited to come to Trinity Kalispell and meet all of you and to be here. But he really felt it was best for, uh, for all of you and then also for uh, his family that he remain uh, just in Illinois for now. And we're going to try to reschedule this around um, the visit around the 10th through the 13th. Now that is a kind of a busy Sunday for us here. We have a lot ministry fair. Um, anyway, it is going to be a busy Sunday, but what a great Sunday to have uh, Pastor Hemingway visit here and he can see all the things that we do. So just keep an eye out for the announcements. If you're not on the church uh, email list, make sure you get on that to contact the office. I'm trying to communicate with everybody that way. And then there'll be uh, blurbs in the bulletin. So sorry for the long message, but God bless your day. Thank you. All right. So anyway, um, glad again for Pastor Reiner being here and everyone else here, you guys. <clears throat> and uh, this was actually, if you recall, this weekend I was supposed to be gone. And I'm not because... Our son's college is going online, and so instead of us going to take him to college this weekend, his college roommates came here last night, and uh, they're going to be spending the semester in our basement apartment, and so, um, so we're happy to have them here, and so that delayed our trip, so we'll be gone next weekend to go get his stuff uh, from college and bring it back. So anyway, um, so Pastor Ryan will be back next week as well, so anyway... Um, have a great day in the Lord. God bless you.